I thought hmm, there's some there's definitely something to this because you know I was obviously waking up with um, better morning wood and noticing more energy and things like that so yeah man then I then I sort of did blood work before and after um, 12 weeks and I managed to get my testosterone all the way up to 988. Welcome to the Seam Lund podcast I'm your host Seam Lund and today our guest is Lucas Owen from Australia. Lucas has studied exercise science and naturopathy and is into many different biohacks. He runs his website at ergogenic.health where he discusses his experiments and shares the latest studies on health, steep, hormone optimization and longevity. This episode is brought to you by Katsu Training. Katsu bands incorporate blood flow moderation training that trick the body into thinking that it's lifting heavier weights than it actually is. When traditional weightlifting requires you to reach 70-80% to 80% of your one repetition maximum to stimulate muscle hypertrophy, then Katsu bands achieve that effect only at 20-30%. to 30%. So, it's perfect for treating injuries or used when you don't have access to heavier weights. Research about Katsu bands also shows it lowers blood pressure, speeds up recovery from injuries, releases stem cells, builds muscle, burns fat, and prevents age the muscle loss. These things are amazing, and I use them almost every day to recover from my heavier workouts. If you want to try out the Katsu bands, then use the code SEAM for a 10% discount at katsu-global.com. That's S-I-I-M at katsu-global.com. Lucas, welcome to the show. SIM, thanks for having me, man. Yeah, I'm uh, glad to talk with you and... You know, uh, it's interesting because, you know, one of the things that you're known uh, online is this uh, experiment that you did with uh, icing your testicles. So I think like a, it would be a good icebreaker between you and the audience to like uh, maybe explain, uh, you know, what, why did you do it and uh, how does it work and what were the kind of results? Yeah, man. Um, so I actually stumbled across the practice, like scrolling through some uh, bodybuilding forums a long time ago. And I've read some some people logging their experience, you know, like, applying an ice pack to their um, testes and I was like hmm I sort of looked into the research and you know I came across some studies sort of um, demonstrating beneficial effects on fertility and so there was like a one particular study that demonstrated that um, icing the testes for like eight to 12 weeks improves a variety of sperm parameters and obviously being the biohacker I am similar to you Sim um, I ended up sort of just trialing it myself. And, you know, I started, I grabbed an ice pack and started applying it, you know, regularly every single night. And um, I thought hmm, there's some, there's definitely something to this. Cause you know, I was obviously waking up with um, better morning wood and noticing more energy and things like that. So yeah, man, then I, then I sort of did blood work before and after um, 12 weeks and I managed to get my testosterone all the way up to 988 mm. nanograms per deciliter. So yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah that's pretty pretty crazy and uh, the, the testosterone level is also quite high we can talk about it a bit later of how you did it but um you know what's the like potential mechanisms of this cold improving i don't know like sperm yeah so the 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 research sort of looked at how um anytime the testes are two degrees too warm so anytime they're outside um you know, increased by two degrees outside outside of core body temperature. They actually it actually arrests spermatogenesis, so it's it actually impairs fertility. So the practice is based around um, you know we're cooling the testes, but we're also one of the mechanisms that hasn't been fully explored is the um, vasoconstriction that occurs. Just like when we have a cold shower or jump into an ice bath, we get severe you know vasoconstriction. I think the same sort of will apply with the testes. We're getting major vasoconstriction up against the actual gonads. And then that's followed by like a rebound sort of vasodilatory response, which makes sense, sort of just bringing more oxygen nutrients to the testes to help with their uh, function. Mm, right. So you wouldn't want to basically have uh, some something hot on, on your lap, uh, sitting like a laptop or something uh, that, that would uh, in, also inhibit this uh, spermatogenesis. Exactly, yeah, and that's a f- one of the leading causes of uh, infertility is is um, just generally like you know being exposed to EMFs and um, just heat in general is having a deleterious effect on sperm parameters. Um, you know, definitely one of the leading culprits behind uh, infertility for sure. Mm-hmm. I also, you know, gotten a lot of questions about like the sauna. Uh, so would that also have like this a negative effect? Yeah, so part of my recommendations when it when it comes to sauna usage is that I think all men need to need to bring an ice pack in with them uh, using the sauna. I know it sounds sounds crazy, but um, 
I mean, I, I've got my own infrared sauna here, full spectrum, you know, mid-near and far infrared. And um, I always make sure to bring an ice pack in. And uh, it just makes sense because traditionally they viewed the, um, the, the sauna or like heat exposure as a, mean, as a male contraceptive a mm. long time ago, like okay. a method of contraception. Right. And uh, is there any, um, let's say, uh, you know, like prescription or protocol with the ice pack, like how many times a day would you need to do it? How long per each session? Yeah, so um, there is no like, I mean, I'm trying to sort of uh, describe like a bit of a protocol and that would be like 10 to 15 minutes up to three times per day. And I think the best way to sort of start is, and one thing that all men need to know is that we don't want to be applying the ice pack directly to the skin of the testes. We don't want to burn the skin. A lot of guys think that it's, you know, applying the ice pack there, but it's just going to damage the skin and burn the skin. So instead you want to apply it directly up against the, the underwear um, okay. for 10 to 15 minutes. Right. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. That was a good clarification. Uh, so yeah. How, how did you, you know, get into uh, this uh, biohacking and health in general? Well, I mean, I've always been fascinated with um, various interventions to improve uh, my performance on the soccer field. So I played, you know, I played professional soccer for many years and, I was always interested in like what could I use or take that could improve my ability to read the play on the soccer field. Um, and that's when I sort of experimented with like L-theanine and acetyl-L-carnitine and things like that, just the basic nootropics. Um, and yeah, just fell in love with the whole idea of taking control of your health. And um, it then just snowballed into like starting the Instagram page and then just sharing really useful research, which a lot of people are, are liking at the moment. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, you have really interesting uh, uh, posts and uh, articles as well and videos, you know, about more or less less conventional ideas. And uh, yeah, it's definitely people should check it out. Uh, but, you know, let's talk about the testosterone experiment. So, um, you know, that's uh, quite high for a natural testosterone. So how did you do it? And uh, you know, what were the things that you maybe experienced as well? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I did devise like a, a full protocol. I, I outlined it. Um, in, in some detail in my um, in my testosterone course, but essentially what I did was um, I focused on lowering prolactin, increasing um, monounsaturated fat intake and saturated fat, so both those types of fats. I was shifting my um, protein sources primarily to organ meats, so eating liver, kidneys, chicken hearts, things like that, rich in zinc, CoQ10, selenium, all these vital nutrients, heaps of cholesterol. I mean... Um, so I was focusing on, you know, high cholesterol diet alongside like five grams of taurine every day, mm. plus like vitamin B1. I was using a couple of herbs like cystanch. Um, I was using a, a, a couple of, I mean, there was one pharmacological intervention that I guess it's not really directly shown to increase testosterone, but it's um, ciproheptidine. So that sort of helped with lowering serotonin. So um, yeah, really focusing on optimizing and driving up dopamine and, and lowering serotonin, I think really helped. Mm, okay. Uh, so w what do you think about this, um, you know, this trend that over the past few decades, this uh, testosterone level, average testosterone levels have been declining because of maybe like xenoestrogens and, you know, bad lifestyle and plastics and chemicals in our environment. Yeah. I mean, there's some crazy stats going around now. I mean, they say that like in 33 years or so from now, all men in the Western world will be infertile, which is, pretty scary stats i mean you've seen you've seen the diagrams the graphs yourself the trending decline is so severe mm. um and i think you definitely hit the nail on the head there's you know emf exposure plastics microplastics um nutrient deficiencies poor sleep obesity insulin resistance lack of exercise there's so many factors you know playing a role mm. in the decline in both fertility and testosterone mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's sort of kind of funny funny thing that um like physically, uh, you know, uh, men uh, are, let's say, more resilient, uh, but at the same time, like their sperm is also very fragile or very vulnerable to uh, very like, you know, these small things like EMF or, I don't know, the, uh, the xenoestrogens and you know, plastics and things like that. <laughs> yeah, it is funny like that. And I like to look at, I like to look at um, testosterone as like the resilience, the resilience hormone, because it does help a man sort of become more robust and withstand stress because there was one particular study that looked at how testosterone can um, help uh, increase a man's willingness to withstand adversity. So 
how long a man could withstand severe adversity and struggle it was the higher the testosterone the longer they could last in like struggling sort of thing right right yeah and uh what, what's your like testosterone now like uh have you changed anything um i mean i know it was a while ago when i got my test done i'd hope to see it a little bit higher by now um i mean i've been experimenting with some things that may help increase it further but um i think yeah, definitely environmental things affect that. At the time that I did the test, my sleep was excellent. I was sleeping like eight hours a night straight. Um, I was definitely in a caloric surplus. Mm-hmm. Whereas right now, I wouldn't. I, I don't know if I would be in a caloric surplus. I'm. I'm doing the one thing that's changed is that I'm doing twenty thousand steps a day. So I'm. I'm not sure what sort of impact that's going to have on uh, my hormone status. Okay, gotcha. Uh, but what 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 are maybe like uh, some of the best like exercises or you know exercise is important for testosterone, but there's also like the aspect of chronic uh, overtraining and uh, yeah not having enough time for recovery. So uh, you know what would be like a good uh, b- way to balance uh, those things and optimizing it. Yeah, well, from from the exercise perspective, um, leading up to that blood test, I was doing two leg sessions per week, and those leg sessions were very heavy, like six to eight reps roughly um and then you know followed by i did two sprint sessions per week as well i'm convinced that sprinting has some phenomenal effect on um, testosterone i've seen evidence that shows that it increases dht um, significantly Um, but in terms of like there was absolutely no uh, long duration cardio Mm. nothing beyond 20 minutes that's been shown to have a deleterious effect on testosterone so yeah avoiding avoiding the the, the the long the low in the list low intensity steady state yeah yeah for yeah. sure yeah and you know what i also like to do is that um focusing more on this very low intensity like you know walking is actually a very low effort way of uh, getting your steps in and getting cardio without uh you know yeah starting to in- interfere with uh, like muscle growth and without uh, interfering with uh, these hormones and things like that so it's a very uh, yeah like a better way of unless you are you know trying to deliberately increase your endurance or something then yeah like a minimal effective dose or minimal effort is a kind of a better way to go about it yeah it was it was tricky because i was trying to balance like i mean i was trying to really optimize for testosterone but at the same time i was trying to like maintain aerobic capacity and like it's you know you're trying to optimize for so many different goals but in the end i think um the combination of icing, certain exercises, certain sleep pr- protocols, a couple of herbs, supplements. I think that all, and then obviously really healthy thyroid function. My um, mm. my T three, my T three levels are like basically like bordering on hyper thyroid. So I think that definitely having a better metabolic rate is definitely going to help as well. Right, and how how would you uh, achieve that with like nutrition? What kind of foods uh, to raise your T three and uh, as well as testosterone? Well. I was I was definitely encouraging myself to like have a lot of carbohydrates. I wasn't I wasn't holding back on carbs when I was trying to optimize testosterone. In fact, I was having upwards of 250 to 300 grams of carbs per day, which is quite I mean moderate moderate to high. Um and yeah, in terms of which carbohydrate sources, I was actually staying away from starchy um carbohydrates cuz I find that they can irritate my gut so sort of um leaning towards the sort of brown rice quinoa you know oats things like that and some yeah. fruit as well yeah yeah, yeah like a two uh, low carb can definitely um eventually have like a negative effect on uh testosterone if you do it like for too long especially if you like have intense training on top of that so yeah i, I also you know like prefer more of like a cyclical approach uh, of doing that but you you mentioned also like the fats and um those things uh how would uh, they contribute to the testosterone yeah i mean so obviously i said sort of um shifting the focus towards um saturated fats and monounsaturated so as the monounsaturated fat sources mostly uh avocados macadamia nuts brazil nuts a little bit of almonds um and there was probably a little bit of um avocado there was a little bit of avocado oil um but then like yeah, predominantly like lean beef. Oh, sorry, like just beef. You know, not worried about the the super lean aspect. But you know, the combination of the saturated fats plus the monounsaturated it realistically is is ideal. And then from the polyunsaturated fats, purely just having the uh, uh, fish or seafood 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. You mentioned there were like like a small uh, surplus, but um, would let's say like if you get too low in body fat, that would also uh, I would imagine eventually have like a negative effect on testosterone. So what was maybe like a what is like an ideal uh, body fat range to have let's say the most optimal testosterone? It's a good question. Um, I haven't fully delved into that, but I think you know something somewhere in the range of say hmm, eleven to maybe fifteen percent body fat, I think would be healthy. Have you seen, I don't know, have you seen much research in that realm? Uh, well, I think that there is there is some, uh, let's say this uh, individuality and everyone has, let's say this, their uh, body fat set point that where their body is uh, functioning optimally. Some people are genetically very easily able to stay at, you know, like 6% all the time, whereas others for them, it's hard to go below 11% uh, because of the you know, body starts to fight it and, yeah. uh, you know, down regulates the hormones. So I think there is some yeah, differences between people. Um, some people, I, I, in general, I think yeah, like around ten percent is probably the best. And you know, staying below ten percent all the time, uh, you know, your your body can get used to it eventually. But let's say uh, for most uh, average people, it can eventually kind of start to catch up. So you 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 really you know, maybe wouldn't be able to uh, stay there year year round. Uh, but yeah, for maybe a few few months of the year, it's gonna probably not gonna have a problem. Yeah, my my body fat according to my I did a DEXA a DEXA scan. And um, everyone was shocked with my results. My results came back as 14%, mm. which you know, like people that look at me, they're like, there's no way you're 14%. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I saw yeah. I saw one of the pictures as well. That, yeah, like you have lean, uh, leanness and the six pack uh, and it tells you 14%, which kind of, uh, you know, makes a lot of people, you know, what <laughs> think that the test is, you know, wrong or something. But yeah, usually people like carry the body fat in different areas as well. And uh, yeah, it's just the... Um, the looks aspect can be, you know, deceiving, so to say, that the percentage itself is also like not really that relevant if people are yeah. after like the looks themselves. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you were also interest, interested into like these adaptogens and uh, different kinds of uh, compounds. So uh, are there any like adaptogens that have been shown to actually, uh, you know, boost testosterone and help with it? I mean, the most well known is is definitely ashwagandha. But my my stance there on ashwagandha, one of my one of my blog posts actually went viral, talking about um how ashwagandha, although it's effective for you know lowering cortisol and um, increasing testosterone, it can have a effect similar to SSRI drugs by sort of desensitizing the um the five HT one A serotonin receptor. So, um. I mean, that, that's something I learned quite some time ago. So I've sort of stayed sort of clear from ashwagandha instead shifting my focus towards um, Korean ginseng, saffed muesli, um, cystanch, pine pollen, and tonkata lee. These are like the main ones that I was leveraging. Um, but yeah, I think definitely my favorite one is uh, cystanch. It's well-known. Uh, it's one of Genghis Khan's favorite herbs. He <laughs> used it right. um, to, to populate much of Asia. So yeah, definitely like that one. <laughs> yeah that's uh, pretty cool uh, and ginseng is also like good for stress management in general and you know stress has like a negative effect on testosterone yeah yeah i like i mean panax panax ginseng is generally very warming and very like sort of stimulating so um and that's also been shown to you know have beneficial effects on um, luteinizing hormone as well hmm. How do you uh, consume it, like uh, as a as the powder or the root or the supplement? Which 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 one is the best? Uh, I always lean towards like a powdered extract. Um, yeah, tend towards like sort of ten percent gin sinicides. Um, but I mean, obviously, I've experimented with a range of <laughs> adaptogens. Another one from Russia, morale mm. roots, which is quite good. Um, rhodiola. I've tried basically yeah. every adaptogen under the sun. <laughs> yeah yeah like uh i also like the rhodiola usually uh you actually kind of feel the effects of it uh, faster as well with it uh but you also uh mentioned in your blog that you had like some health issues in the past so you know what what, what were they and how did you kind of solve them well i mean the one thing that sort of got me into this my dad being a pharmacist uh i was i actually suffered from reflux heartburn um and this was ongoing very young age was prescribed um, proton pump inhibitors, so like Nexium, Sodomac. And that was leading to, now that I understand the research, what it's doing, I understand that, you know, clearly that's affecting vitamin B12 absorption, iron absorption, uh, magnesium. So that was definitely having a deleterious effect on my health at the time. And that's sort of what transitioned, what 
prompted me to to study naturopathy um, and complete my natu- 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 naturopathic um, degree. And so, yeah, like the the reflux and heartburn was definitely a major factor and major reason why I got so interested in health and then sort of biohacked my way out of that using um, like gentian root and artichoke extract. And I don't even, you know, I haven't needed any reflux medications for like, I don't know, eight years now. Mm. So, okay. Nice. Yeah, yeah, the... Um... These medications tend to have, uh, yeah, like a, even like you know, proton pump inhibitors. They um, reduce the absorption of potassium as well, and uh, so yeah, you you may actually get worse uh, fr- from using them uh, chronically, at least. Uh, mm. What what about uh, have you looked into things like you know cognition and mental side, like any nootropics, any research on that? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm heavily involved in, and I spend a lot of time researching um, nootropics and. Um, cosmetic neurology, which definitely is an area that I'm really fascinated in. Um, so yeah, I mean, I've experimented with hundreds of different uh, nootropics, you know, ranging from you know L-theanine, L-carnitine, CDP-choline, alpha-GPC, just a range of really, you know, un- sort of. I guess they're well known now, some of these ones. But I've you know I've used a range of other ones. Uh, a couple of my favorites. I sort of I think I mentioned one of them is a uh, uh, bromantine which is a it's a synthetic it's a synthetic adaptogen so it's developed by the russians to sort of um see if they could help their soldiers uh, withstand stress and bromantine is definitely one of those compounds that helps with just physical energy and um just being more motivated sort of thing okay well that's interesting how does it what, what's what is it or how does it get formulated where do we extract it uh bromantine basically was actually modeled off um, a compound called Bemetil. Um, and it works through a unique enzyme in the, in the brain. And it's an enzyme that um, needs to be addressed, which is ignored. And that's like most people that use L-tyrosine or um, phenylalanine, these amino acids, their ability to get converted into dopamine is regulated by the enzyme tyrosine hydroxylase. So that enzyme that converts the tyrosine into L-dopa, that's where bromantane comes. It actually upregulates that enzyme to shuttle more tyrosine into dopamine. So it's having a, it's actually having an epigenetic effect on this enzyme. So it's actually increasing hmm. the uh, mRNA expression, which is awesome. Okay, right. So dopamine is uh, you know known as the kind of reward chemical and helps with motivation and attention. Uh, so I, I would imagine that if you have, let's say, high high dopamine, then you're also more eager to do the things that you need to do, even if you're, let's say, because a lot of the times, like, you know, starting to work or being productive is actually having this intrinsic motivation to do it. And if you have this intrinsic motivation, then you, uh, you even if you are tired, the intrinsic motivation is going to override that and you are still able to focus and uh, get the thing done. So that's a, like a an important way of actually boosting your uh, productivity and motivation uh, through like internal internal means. Exactly. And I like to look at dopamine as the anti-procrastination neurotransmitter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you know, but at the same time, there's also like, you know, dopamine is involved in like addiction and uh, that sort of thing as well. So that kind of gets a, gets a bad rap uh, because of, because of this association. Yeah. I mean the, the whole addiction side, I think, um, yeah, definitely, it definitely plays a role, but I think the, the opioid, the opioid network is definitely more reinforcing and, and addictive you know like activating that mu opioid receptor can be more um, yeah. reinforcing yeah for sure and th- that's where like serotonin may actually be uh like a negative thing exactly yeah so that's where serotonin can um have a dampening effect on um the, the pleasure response um can contribute to something known as anhedonia which is the inability to experience pleasure which um People can get from using 5-HTP, tryptophan, uh, melatonin, things like that. Mm. So it, it's like almost like you know, you know, there's a lot of this uh, online that I need to dopamine fast uh, to kind of clear my receptors from like uh, I don't know, eating junk food or watching pornography or uh, being addicted to social media. I need to kind of dopamine fast, but you know, the the serotonin may actually be the problem then, <laughs> not the dopamine. Exactly, exactly, and I think. Um, you'd be surprised how many people have chronically high serotonin and then I realize that let's look at just for men, for example, t- uh, serotonin is having a 
suppressive effect on testosterone. Serotonin has a suppressive effect on a thyroid stimulating hormone. You know, it's, it's having, it's a, it really is a hibernation, hibernation neurotransmitter. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Can you explain that? Like what is actually serotonin and uh, yeah, what are the main effects on the body? Well, serotonin is um, a compound, um, a neurotrans- neurotransmitter that's synthesized from uh, tryptophan. So found abundant in like turkey um, or walnuts and its role, it's considered a neuromodulator. It's, I mean, it, it does seem to modulate a lot of um, other neurotransmitter systems, but in general, someone, a, a person with high serotonin is often very compliant and very obedient. And so like they can follow orders and it, I mean, that's, just, that sort of makes sense why, we, you know, the SSRI medications um, can make people feel like a zombie because they're basically flooded yeah. with serotonin and, you know, they're, they're just, they have no, they, they can't no think. No motivation. Um, yeah. 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 It's- but serotonin is also like you know associated with like sleep and relaxation, which is comes the hibernation side. Exactly. So yeah, definitely regulating. Um, I think the the main the main area of research in regards to serotonin is actually in the gut, and we know that you know ninety ninety percent of the serotonin is made in our gut. Um, but serotonin is what causes diarrhea when there's too much. You know, okay. too much serotonin can increase peristalsis. <laughs> gotcha. So how would you like what what would be the like the you know, uh, like a good amount of serotonin. You obviously don't want to have too much, but, you know, I would imagine like not enough can also cause, you know, just the irritation or uh, not being able to relax and sleep. Yeah, I mean, if we had the, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of hoping that in the next couple of years we have technology that can accurately assess neurotransmitters in the brain um, because it's difficult to ascertain like the levels of serotonin in specific brain regions because, one could have high serotonin in, say, like the amygdala versus they may not have high serotonin in the hypothalamus. And we know that serotonin's function and role in these different brain regions will exert a completely different effect. Mm. So I think, um, yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing that sort of research, in, you know, maybe in the next few years or so. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, let's say if someone is uh, in this slump of uh, hibernation, so to say, they don't feel any motivation and they are very obedient, so to say, uh, following the rules and uh, orders. Like, how would be like a good way to uh, lower the serotonin? Then, like, is there any, is there anything like that is artificially spiking the serotonin too high in our environment and making us, you know, imbalanced? I mean, if from a from an anti serotonin sort of perspective, um, one compound that's pretty readily available, activated charcoal, seems to have an anti serotonin effect. Um, Okay. Vitamin B1 can, you know, exert, can help to increase the uptake of serotonin. Um, but generally speaking, like exposure to bright, you know, going out and seeing the sun, exposure to the sun, that's going to help to lower that hmm. um, serotonin. Gotcha. And also boosts uh, motivation or dopamine from the sun. Exactly. Hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Um, what You also had like a post about uh, naltrexone. Uh, so maybe talk about what is it and uh, what was the experiment? Or the geez, research, I mean, research. Yeah, I was looking back at naltrexone and, you know, I was wondering, geez, why did I go down that path? I mean, I, I know what it does. It basically, naltrexone is the, um, it's basically an antidote or an ant, it's an opioid antagonist. So it blocks the opioid receptors um, and it can also block, sorry, the uh, endorphins. So uh, it can have an anti-endorphin effect and that seems to have a, a powerful modulatory role on the immune system. And, and I originally started researching it in the context of autoimmune disease because, you know, many people were seeing improvements in their autoimmune symptoms using low-dose naltrexone. Um, so I ended up getting some maybe three years ago. Um, and within 30 minutes of taking the first dose, I think it was 2. Point, it was 2.5, 2.5 milligrams, which is moderate, low, moderate to low. I did a workout. I went to, you know, did some sprint training. And uh, I remember usually my response from sprinting is that I get, I get a, you know, feel good, you know, definitely like a bit of a rush, an endorphin rush after sprinting. And I remember on this low dose naltrexone, I had none of that. And I felt actually really flat, like really flat. Mm. And I was like, I sort of, I knew that was coming. Um, So, and that seems to have like, it had, 
a mild rebound effect. So like after blocking the uh, endorphins, the endorphin receptors, um, it can have a rebound elevation mm. and modulation effect. Okay. So did you get it like any uh, post, uh, post uh, dose uh, like a uh, rebound? Uh, I mean, it took a few days. I don't know what's wrong. With, so I honestly think that my blood brain barrier is extremely leaky. Okay. It must have let too much <laughs> naltrexone in, but uh, it took a while. It took like three to four days to really notice the rebound effect. Okay. And uh, how, how, how did it feel or like, what was it any different? Uh, I guess I just felt more social, a bit more outgoing, just in a better mood, more resilient. Um, but it's also been shown to raise testosterone as well. Um, it's, it's, I, know, I know it's been used in a fertility study, but I mean, I, from my, if I would have, I wouldn't recommend anyone sort of just go out and experiment with that. It's a, it is a pharmaceutical medication it needs to be used under guidance. Um, so right. only, this, if you're, oh, <laughs> only if your dad is a pharmacist, <laughs> <laughs> it's like, uh, uh, do not try this experiment at home. And I tried right. it at home. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, what about sleep? Uh, like, you know, sleep is also very important for just uh, testosterone and overall health. Do you have like any um, special hacks or uh, compounds that you use for sleep? Yeah, man. I mean, my favorite hack at the moment's uh, mouth taping. I've been mouth taping for you know a number of months. Uh, in in fact, probably over a year now. Um, mouth taping is awesome because it supports you know, nitric oxide production because most of the nitric oxide is produced, you know, in the nasal cavity. Um, I also incline my bed. So I've inclined my bed about um, six inches. Um, I find that's, I know some of the initial studies were looking at um, improving varicose veins and helping with glymphatic drainage, helping with the brain. Um, and also I've been using a particular seaweed, uh, a brown seaweed called Eclonia carva. It's, one of, it's an impressive um, it's a, a marine drug that's you know really effective for. It copies a lot of the effects that L-theanine does in the brain. Mm, okay, uh, and L-theanine is uh, you know has uh, these relaxing effects, of lowering your exc- excitation and uh, you know focus. Not focus, but you know this. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, excitement. Yeah. So I mean, Eclonia carva um, seems to increase alpha waves in the brain similar to alphenine it's also helping with a GABA response and it lowers cortisol quite dramatically as well hmm. okay uh but you do, let's say um the uh is like does would GABA also have like the similar effect as serotonin if you let's say get too much of it making you too docile or too kind of hibernating you know what well, it's a great question um and i've i've recently began to ponder that as well whether Excess inhibitory neurotransmission, such as GABA, so excess GABA, mm-hmm. it may have a, a you know blunting effect on glutamate, and glutamate is the opposite to GABA, and that's excitatory, stimulating. Um, but usually, the case is that most people have you know excess glutamate, um, not enough GABA. But I mean, that's a bit of a bit of a broad statement because, like, do we have research on that? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> hmm. Okay. As, but you would, would you ever recommend taking like a GABA supplement or something? I do use it um, sort of infrequently. I'll, I mean, I've, I'm going away on a holiday fairly soon and I've packed some GABA. Like I might use it very sparingly um, at a low dosage. I do notice tolerance if I use it consistently. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I, I like GABA. I like to use GABA sparingly, like once or twice a week. Gotcha. Uh, but what about melatonin? Melatonin supplement? Geez, I mean, I was yeah, I mean, I was very very excited when I found out about melatonin, some of the the pleiotrophic effects it has in the in the body, antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, some remarkable immune effects. But um, unfortunately, like experimenting with melatonin just left me disappointed. Um, I, I just prefer like right now, I just prefer to you know wear my blue blockers, you know, five o'clock, six o'clock at night, and you know. Just wearing my blue blockers alone. I did a Dutch test recently, mm-hmm. and um, my melatonin levels were were on the top end of, this, of the range. And I'm like, it makes sense. I don't need to use melatonin. The only time I would ever yeah. consider it is uh, jet lag. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I also agree that 
you know, uh, I, although I do think that there isn't this negative feedback that your body would stop producing melatonin if you take it as a supplement, I think it's still like, you know, uh, kind of more better to just use it uh, when you, you do have like a bad night's sleep or you're trying to catch up on some on bad night's sleep and uh, things like that. Because, yeah, usually because then it's, you, you may develop this uh, psychological dependency that, oh, I need to take it in order to have uh, yeah. like a good better sleep. And that creates like maybe this placebo like feedback loop. Uh, so it's yeah, better to always, you know, you know, you always use it when you actually need it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And um, the other aspect of that is like a lot of people are actually like overdosing melatonin without realizing. Hmm. Um, I was really, I was a big fan of um, Smart Drug Smarts podcast. He had a guest talking about um, melatonin supplements and realistically the most ideal dosage is 300 micrograms sustained release whereas most supplements are selling like three milligrams or 10 milligrams which is super high mm, right yeah but that can definitely be like um you know again you may feel t tired and drowsy if you take too much in the morning mm. uh but uh is there is there like any you know melatonin is usually helps with like deep sleep um but is there any way to specifically increase a REM sleep that usually some people uh, struggle with yeah so from the REM sleep optimization sort of thing um rhodiola was was researched um in combination with acetylzolamide it actually does increase rem sleep um i would assume that would be the high rosevans extracts there's two different types of you know constituents i've used the salidricide and the rosevans the, the rosevans um extract the high percentage of rosevans was more calming um so if, if i were to like sort of look at rem sleep optimization really we just want to ensure we're getting sufficient like vitamin B6, vitamin A, um, and some of these essential nutrients, magnesium, zinc. Um, these all have a, a, a positive effect on REM sleep. Gotcha. And uh, any any like other besides uh, compounds, like any hacks or any technology, any any like kind of beta routines or something to <laughs> help with that? Uh, at one stage, I was yeah, experimenting with the uh, acupressure mat. I um, with the spikes um i mean i did i did get a good response initially again I, f I felt like i built tolerance to that really quickly um but in terms of yeah like the inclining my beds mouth taping blue blockers eclonia carva and then um yeah i mean occasionally i might use um ciproheptadine um which sort of does help with sleep uh but from my experience our uh, bpc 157 that increased my i mean it increased my deep sleep dramatically dramatically mm. really well so bpc is like uh, a pep peptide and uh, it's usually mo mostly known for like it's um, helps to recover from injuries and tendon ligaments and that sort of thing so how would it how would it help with the sleep well if you look at some of the other research i know bpc is um, well studied for improving um, muscle sorry muscle soreness and um ligament like torn ligaments and injuries it's also research to heal the gut you know leaky gut things like that um but it also has been shown to help restore the gaba um system like it has some restorative effects on the gaba network so i think i'd imagine that's probably how it helps with uh sleep hmm. so kind of uh, just um repairs the brain if that makes sense yeah yeah it's it's a phenomenal compound gotcha uh have you used it for other have you like used it for this uh, injury treatment itself as well well i that's the that's the reason why i first tried it was because i tore my medial meniscus um and sort of um i used bpc for about two weeks and after about a week or so um there was no pain in my knee and so i was having a this was orally as well like most peptides have to be injected but bpc is unique because it's a, an oral orally bioavailable peptide which is mm. what we what we want okay well oh, yeah that's uh, good to know any other peptides that you have used um i haven't really played around with too many i mean back in the day i did use um a particular bovine so like a it was like a pig uh, peptide uh, amino acid amino acid complex um that was mostly for muscle building and um, recovery and things like that. It helps with increasing nitrogen retention. So I'm sure it was having a positive effect on 
uh, protein synthesis. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm probably, I'll be getting into peptides in the next probably like five to 10 years because I think there's some really phenomenal, phenomenal up and coming peptides. Hmm. So have you looked at the research about the current you know, state? I mean, there's one particular, it's not really a, a peptide, but there's one small molecule uh, for fat loss. Um, as one of my highest performing uh, YouTube videos, it's called 5-amino-1-MQ. Um, and this particular molecule seems to increase intracellular NAD levels. Um, mm. Like, you know, instead of taking a nicotinamide mononucleotide or um, any other nic NAD supplement, it seems to increase it intracellularly. Um, I spoke to Ryan Smith from TaylorMade and um, he said some pretty phenomenal things about it. It also increases... Uh, skeletal muscle satellite cell production so um helping with stem cell production things like that um so yeah five amino one mq is definitely a really cool compound okay <laughs> that's interesting so yeah like the, the pep pep peptides themselves are you know um supposed to be research chemicals and they're not like for uh, human consumption unless you have uh, like a, maybe a doctor who is prescribing it so how would uh, maybe uh, people who are interested in it how would they i don't know uh, learn more about it or how would, where, where can they actually get it from some facility uh well i had a ch i mean i spoke to ben greenfield and and um uh, ryan smith from taylor made and i ended up um finding a really reliable vendor um which i'm now an affiliate partner with They're, it's on my website people just search um five amino one mq um they'll see i've linked to a particular product that has really good um reviews okay gotcha um so what about, uh, have you ever done it or what, what's your thoughts on uh, fasting? Geez, I mean, I mean, I spent a lot of time researching. I mean, I do fast maybe five days a week. Up maybe my first meal is often around 11.30 midday. Um, and that's like the highest protein, high fat meal. Um, but to be honest, like my goals are very much contrary to sort of implementing the fasting because I'm trying to build as much muscle as I can at the moment. Whilst you can build a lot of muscle still fasting, um, I just can't get enough calories in if I fast too much. So um, I do fast, but I do it sparingly. Hmm. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, like you, you do it, uh, but um, what do you think about the research or something? <laughs> what have you, what was your thoughts about is, is there any potential for it? for from like a health perspective oh absolutely from like a longevity longevity and uh, metabolic health and insulin sensitivity i'm a big fan i'm a big fan i think it's um you know the research is strong it does help with you know inc improving increasing lifespan and, and overall health span um but i mean i i also don't mind the use of um fasting mimetic compounds like spermidine and metformin but um dihydroberberine, things like that. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, those things uh, do mimic, at least like turn on the same pathways in the body as uh, fasting or calorie restriction does. And, uh, mm. you know, ar arguably I would have like, you know, what I also like to think about is that there are ways to kind of speed up the benefits of fasting, uh, like with things like exercise or saunas or yeah, taking these different compounds. So you can get like some of the benefits faster without you needing to, you know, fast for uh, days and days because yeah, like you, maybe you would need to fast for three days to get you into autophagy, but uh, that will only be the case if you're like sedentary and uh, insulin resistant and those things that you, you you don't have like this uh, energy stress on the body. Whereas you, you do have this higher energy stress uh, by with the exercise or the mimetics, then uh, this uh, process is going to be uh, that much faster. Mm. Yeah, somebody should uh, retitle these compounds as like faster fasting or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which, which ones, uh, yeah, you mentioned uh, berberine, berberine and metformin. Uh, so which one do you think is like your favorite? Well, I actually like, a, there's like a new, there's a new form of berberine, which I think's got a lot, you know, it's going to be trending a lot more, the dihydroberberine. It's a metabolite of, um, of berberine that seems to have much better bioavailability than regular berberine. So um Dihydroberberine at about 50 to 100 milligrams per day is equivalent to like 500 to 1,000 milligrams of berberine. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I'll tend to load up on that around my um, highest carb meal of the day. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, sure. And that helps to uh, lower the blood sugar and uh, lower the insulin as well. I also do use metformin uh, about t- maybe twice a week or so. Um, and that's usually under, I mean, that's under very strict circumstances. So if I've had a really poor night's sleep, um, the next day I'll, I'll have metformin because I know I'm insulin resistant. <laughs> um, and I'll also, if I'm going to have a cheap, like go out and have some fun on the weekend or whatever, I'll have metformin. If I'm going to eat like crappy food, like pizzas right. and whatever, I'll have metformin. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's biohacking, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, what about coffee? What do you think about coffee for the health benefits? Like, is, is there actually, like, there's a lot of controversy that some people don't think that it's healthy at all, where some other think, you know, they, they, well, at least, like, I have also seen, like, a lot of research about uh, the benefits of coffee. Yeah. I mean, I'm someone who I actually, I, I don't drink coffee at all. Um, and the reason it's not that I don't like coffee. I really enjoy it and I really feel good on it. I have more energy. I feel great. The only reason why I don't drink coffee is because, um, I lose track of my baseline. It ends up mm. giving me this sort of false level of energy and I just forget like, where am I at? And then eventually one or two days after drinking coffee, I'm like, if I don't have coffee on the third day, I mean, I'm struggling. Like my adrenals are so shot that I really struggle. So honestly, I just have, um, you know, I have decaf coffee or some other sort of caffeine alternatives. Hmm, gotcha. But what, what, what does the research uh, say? Like what is, what are the main, um, main uh, benefits to coffee? Uh, overall, we see an improvement in um, liver function over time. So reduction in um, liver cancer, it increases DHT, it improves uh, testosterone, it improves um, the microbiome. I mean, I think coffee has a has a broad effect on improving uh, lifespan and longevity, provided that the individual uses it consistently. I think this, it, and one to two cups per day. I don't think pushing it any beyond maybe 200 milligrams per day is very beneficial. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think for most people who really struggle with like energy and adrenal issues, then I think caffeine can be slightly hijacking um their adrenals right yeah for sure there's a uh, definitely too much um that is uh may happen uh but um yeah what is the uh, let's say mechanism or the reasons why coffee has these benefits and would it would it, would it be like the caffeine or would it be also like the you know polyphenols that you get from even like decaf coffee like which one is it i think it's the combination i mean there's studies that show that caffeine by itself has a different effect to caffeine in, in coffee. Like, so we know that it, like these polyphenols, they, they're also, some of them are psychoactive. Um, some of them have, they modulate the microbiome. I think when we look at coffee, we're not just looking at the caffeine. Absolutely. We need to look in the, the full picture, the polyphenols, the uh, caffeic acid, the chlorogenic acid, the, you know, there's, there's a range of, unique uh, polyphenols that again work on the gut work on uh, binding to the bitter bitter receptors in the in the back of the tongue the bitter receptors in the stomach the bitter receptors stimulate um you know gallbladder bile release improve liver function so i think yeah overall the the benefits really lie in the whole package the way that nature designed gotcha yeah yeah and is there like any alternatives to coffee like any teas or something um, I, I really like yerba mate. I mean, I respond quite well to yerba mate tea, South American um, tea. Um, that, that's rich in theobromine um, that has a longer half-life and seems to have a smoother energy kick than, than coffee. Um, and then there's also uh, one compound that I really like. Um, it's called tea cream, which seems to be a similar molecule to caffeine, but it's... Um, has a much longer half-life and also has no signs of tolerance or um, habituation, which is, that's what we want. We want a compound that, you know, builds, doesn't build tolerance. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so like the green tea is also very uh, researched and uh, has also similar antioxidant effects and uh, protective effects from cancer and uh, things like that. So yeah. Yeah. Very, very ancient, <laughs> to, you know, at beverage. Uh, well, Lucas, it's been really fascinating to talk with you and uh, we could definitely spend hours on all the different uh, research uh, you've done and all the topics. 
Uh, but uh, yeah, we'll start uh, wrapping things up as well. Before I ask my last question, um, where can people learn more about you and your work? Yeah, awesome. Just want to say uh, thanks for having me on the show, Sim. It's been uh, it's been fun. People can um, check me out on uh, Instagram, uh, ergogenic underscore health, and also check me out on YouTube. Um, the it's just type in boost your biology. Um, there'll be a whole channel there, so they can check that out. Awesome. We're gonna put all the links in the show notes. And uh, my last question is. Uh, What's this one piece of advice or a habit that you wish you adopted sooner? Oh, geez, that's a that's a tough one. One piece or habit. Oh, okay. The biggest one for me is actually don't underestimate the impact of social connections. Like mm. you can biohack all day, you can go on the treadmill desk, you can go on the sauna, but I think social connections, having a good community and a tribe is really what makes me feel the best. Mm. Yeah, yeah, and research also shows that helps with like actually living longer. <laughs> so if you want to, yeah, if you want to live longer, then you need to have uh, good social connections. <laughs> That's it. That's oh, it. Awesome. Well, uh, it's great talking with you, and yeah, I'll see you around in the future. Likewise, Sim. Take care, man.